Welcome to the Progressing Lives Everywhere podcast, brought to you by the Amoria Bond Group. In each episode, we feature prominent business leaders and industry experts sharing their personal experiences and inspiring anecdotes of what progression means to them and insights into their specialist fields, as well as tools, techniques, and practical steps we can all take to progress lives everywhere. Hi. I'm Natasha Crump, ESG Director at Amoria Bond. I'm delighted to introduce my guest today, Joe Wimblegroves. Joe is co-founder of award-winning company Active Digital, the only Telefonica O2 direct partner in the UK to have won a global award for customer experience. And she's won plenty of personal awards too. Joe was named Entrepreneur of the Year at the Every Woman in Tech Awards and was listed in the Times Today magazine's 35 Under 35 as well as scooping numerous wins at the Kent Women in Business Awards. Jo is a podcaster and author, and her Guilty Mother blog has over 50,000 social media followers. She also contributes to numerous publications, including the Huffington Post, and is co-creator of We Are Girls in Sport, a global platform to inspire more girls around the world to find a sport they enjoy to improve their physical and mental well-being. Welcome, Jo. It's great to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure. I've been really looking forward to this. Me too, me too. And I'm glad to hear that. I'm, I'm going to start with my, my usual opening question and just ask Jo, what does progression mean to you personally? Progression? Well, it's quite simple, really, in some respects. It's, it's about making progress. It's about being better tomorrow than, than where we are today. And you can think about that on a business level and you can think about that on a personal level on a personal level I think as we get older every day we are always striving to be better tomorrow than the position that we are today and and we can do that through learning through um, acquiring new skills through trying something new trying something different and progression when it comes to our subject today, which is, you know, thinking about STEM and, and what that means for, for us. I think progression is about thinking about how far we've come in the last 100 years. But we also know there's a huge gender gap, which I know we're going to come on to. And thinking about that progression still has a lot more to a lot further to go. But again, we really sometimes need to take a, a step to reflect actually how far we've come as well. That's really interesting. And actually, it's something we we did take a moment to pause and reflect on ourselves at the AGM um, this year was actually the pace of change within STEM sectors, particularly over the last 12, 18 months, kind of in the wake of the pandemic. Let's not overdwell on that. But um, it really has been and continues to be incredibly rapid change, doesn't it? It's a really exciting time to be in the digital space. I mean, I would know running a, a digital communications company myself, uh, we sell the Humble Mobile Phone. We're an Apple partner. We sell something that everybody wants and everybody needs and no one will get rid of. Um, and as you say, I think we have to look at the positives of the pandemic, if we can, just for a moment, on how digital skills have been dramatically increased not just by adults but by children and in many homes you might find that it's you know the parents turning to their children to help them with technical support because they haven't got their loyal IT department to hand and and it's things like that whereas the digital skills particularly for boys and girls you know across all genders really it's it's enabling them to use technology you know to harness the power of learning and not thinking about technology as in, you know, sometimes the time that it sucks away where we go down rabbit holes looking at different platforms, but actually we can use digital learning in such a positive way. It's interesting, and I think that this will come out through the podcast, but when we've spoken previously, something that really shines out from, from you, for me, is that you do look for the positive, you look for that opportunity. And I wonder... Is that part of kind of your personal progression formula, that kind of let's look for, let's look for the positive or the opportunity in that way? I think you have to be, I think you always have to be positive. And and as I say, even through these difficult times that we've had, 
I have to think about the positive. So I found it really, really difficult just being away from my team. I've always worked in an office for over two decades, even though I've got the opportunity to work from home, I choose not to because I like to get up and go and, and, and feel like I'm I'm out of my house and, and in my work environment. And, and you try to fight it, you try to fight change, but actually I think you've got to be positive in the fact that um, so much of us have got time back that we didn't really know that we even had. I've spent so much more time with my children, um, you know, been getting more exercise. And you do have to think about the positives in in all aspects of life. And, you know, we think, I'm sure we're going to get onto role modelling, but surely that's what we should be, the val- some of the values that we should be teaching our, our children of, of today and tomorrow. Absolutely. And, and role modelling is is definitely on the agenda for today. Um, <laughs> I'm just interested in something you, you mentioned there. You talked about kind of missing being around your teams. And I'm just interested to know how you've kind of, how you've addressed that gap. What's, what have you found has worked? Because I think most of us now accept that hybrid working is probably going to be the way forward. There will we are not going to move back to kind of everyone in the office nine to five, seven, five days a week. Nearly said seven. Um, <laughs> but but what's kind of been what have been the, the things that have worked for you? Thinking particularly from a continuing to progress and develop your teams and kind of connect with them. What's worked? What's worked? I think um we've been making time to have regular company catch-ups where we're keeping everybody uh, really in line with perhaps three simple structures on where our goals are because I think sometimes things get a little bit disjointed on people not only just trying to get on with their day-to-day job but also thinking about what are the what are the company goals and what are we trying to achieve so what I really like about the work I do with my brother who I co-own the, the business with is really trying to think about getting everybody aligned whether it's through voice notes whether it's through zoom whether it's through pre-recorded messages that everybody even though we we feel so apart we still feel really connected in that we've got potentially a single goal or three goals that we want to achieve over the next three months or six months and everybody within the organization feels like they're, they're all on the same on the same page and and I think with leadership it does come down to making sure you're you're guiding your team in the right way let them know where we're going what we're aiming for and how they pay play an important part in that to you know whatever department they're in everybody plays their part in helping us to get there um so so keeping keeping the vision really really clear and and giving the team space to find that clarity on what's important to the company but what's important within their role is really important and what's also worked for us is is our well-being app that we created in-house and we monitor the well-being of our staff on a weekly basis we collect data uh, that they are happy to share with us, which which talks about their stress levels. We ask them how they're managing because we don't know how they're managing from home. And sometimes it can feel very British that everybody's OK. Everybody's always fine. Um, but actually what's bubbling under the surface is really important that we capture that information. So we look at sleep patterns. How are they sleeping? Their stress levels. We obviously ask about any COVID symptoms um, and, and just get a really good understanding. And from that data, we can... Uh, you know, for example, let's say that it's a scale of out of 10. If somebody's you know, giving a seven out of 10, which we might consider reasonably high, we can flag that to their team manager so their team manager can understand what their workload's looking like. Is there anything that could be delegated to a colleague or perhaps, you know, perhaps they're having some stressful times at home because they've got really young children and actually they're just not managing that well because, you know, sometimes it's very brave to put your hand up and say, look, I'm struggling at the moment. So, you know, we're using we're using our, our tools that we've made and created. We're now selling as an off the shelf product, which is also really exciting because I think from an, you know, an, an employee perspective, uh, they want to know that the organisation that they work for, no matter what size it is, is really taking care of them because that's what we've seen, isn't it? That that in order to have a high performance team and an award winning team like we are, to perform to a high you know high performing level then we've got to make sure that we're in really good shape that every individual feels like they can work to their personal best and to do that we've got to give them the tools and we've got to be making sure we're looking after them and listening to them leaders are very good at talking but you know we've got to listen as well absolutely i'd love to know the the name of the app and we, we can add that as well in um to the show notes too but if you want to give it a shout out yeah, so it's called um, ILG One, 
Um, and it is coming. It is coming very soon. But I'll share some information on that. But uh, yeah, we've been using it for years, you know, uh, probably about four years now. So way before uh, the global pandemic. But um, yeah, we're sort of ready. To, we used ourselves as our, our guinea pig, I suppose. But we're just starting to, to get some, some pilots out there to get businesses using it now. What's really interesting, I think, with um, with the focus kind of that companies have started to invest more around well-being, and we've we've had um, we've had a, a podcast guest in the in the past talking about well-being at work and the need to normalise conversations. A lady called Wanda D'Ambrosia, and um, that those conversations are happening more. But I think when you start adding tools and technologies in that actually help present that data, that help kind of give employees the opportunity to express how they're feeling with maybe having the awkwardness of the conversation but also give the leaders within the business the information they need to understand how they can target support because I think companies are really trying to support the well-being of their people it's a conversation we have a lot we know that it's really important um, to to applicants, if you want to attract great people, that's the kind of thing that they're looking for in part in terms of your culture. But actually, it can be quite hard to understand how best to help your people. So it sounds like a brilliant tool. Um, so yeah, they will definitely share share the details there. Yeah, you that'd talked, be great. You talked a lot about goals there. And I just wonder, thinking about your approach to your own personal progression, has having very clear goals in mind been important to you and do you think that that how do you think that's helped you in terms of your success in your career it is and you know goals are really important and um sometimes they can be small goals sometimes they can be bigger goals long-term goals goals that can take years um for example writing a book was always an ambition of mine from when i was 10 years old so that would probably be quite a long-term goal um but it doesn't mean that I can't write it down on my list, my, my wish list of something that I want to achieve. Um, and actually, I'd been planning that book for almost three years before I got a publishing contract, because that's how long sometimes these things take. Um, but then you've got the smaller goals thinking, how can I support more girls in STEM? What can I do? Who can I reach out to? And they could be small wins, even like meeting you, Natasha, through somebody, through a mutual friend, you meet somebody, think, how can we use our power of influence to come together to share a conversation that could be really useful for somebody else? And that could be a small win, a small goal, and we've ticking it off. And every time we have a conversation or every time I speak at an event, I could be talking to, you know, 100 girls who are considering a career in STEM and all of a sudden I've just, you know, nudged them in the right direction. Who knows? And that's the thing that gives me quite a lot of joy, to be honest. I know that role modelling is really important to you. Um, and I'd like to kind of come to that a little bit now. You started your business, Active Digital, with your brother. And if I'm right, at just 16 years old, was that right? Yes. So yeah. I had <laughs> finished my GCSEs and was starting to do um, my A-levels. Uh, my brother is four years older than me. And he had an idea that he wanted to start a mobile phone company. Um, and he asked if I would sort of give him a hand. It was only ever supposed to be short term for me. Um, but I felt like I was in a position where I wanted to maybe give it a go, even though I wasn't quite sure where that journey was going to lead. But I think when you are potentially 16, 17 years old, you actually are quite confident at that age and you're quite happy to give things a try in, in many cases because you feel like you're at an age where you don't really have anything to lose and you've got everything to gain. And um, and it was it was a really interesting experience because I felt really confident that that I could that I could do well, but equally, I felt a lot of challenges being a young teenager trying to approach a bank manager or trying to sort of run a business with my brother, and then not always feeling like I was being taken seriously. I think I was I was born with a bit of a you know I do have a bit of a baby face, which which obviously has lots of benefits. But I think when I was younger, I was so desperate to be to be older and to be taken seriously and. It's just that 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 vicious circle, isn't it, Natasha? Of you know, when you're when you're younger, you you can't wait to be older, and you just want to be older all the time. And then when you're older, you just reminisce about when you were younger. So it just it just yeah. the whole circle. <laughs> it's the age age old thing that you kind of that lesson that you want to be able to teach every young person to just love being young and make the most of it. But you know, I remember people telling me that when I was younger and not listening. But 
And I, I, I know when we've spoken in the past as well, you talked about there were just no role models for you as a kind of young female entrepreneur in the tech tech industry. Yeah, I, I, I did feel quite alone. I mean, I was very lucky because I've got a protective big brother. So I suppose in some respects, he was a good role model for me. But we are really different as individuals, um, which sort of makes a business successful. And that's something we could come on to is, you know, focusing on your differences is actually really important. And, and we're both really different, which is where we work in different areas of the business is, is what makes it so successful, I feel. Um, but I think when I was younger, I used to go to events at Telefonica O2 and you know, some of the faces that are around our business have been around telecoms for, for 20 odd years. Um, but I was one of the only young women, I would probably say, in the room. And a lot of the leaders at O2, they were all men. And I did get on with them quite well, but I used to find it quite difficult to get into the conversations. If you imagine you're sort of standing in a circle with your coffee and you're trying to get into a conversation, I always felt like a bit of an outsider. And um, there were some events that I just didn't always feel comfortable going to. But I but I did always go because it's important to, I was sort of the face of Active Digital. And at the time, my brother, um, it, you know, he, he always felt that that was my thing. Joe's, you know, the face of Active and goes around with her smiley face and makes connections and networks. Um, social butterfly is what they often call me at work. It's sort of you know, float around meeting new people and talking to people about their about their work and their business and their interests. Um, but it wasn't until I was a bit older, probably in my 30s, that I started wearing more dresses, started wearing more colour. And actually, I found myself wanting to leverage my position as a woman in tech because of the minority of, of us uh, and leverage it to my um, to my advantage. So I started turning up to events in maybe like a bright red dress and rather than feeling like I needed to sink into the room in my little grey dress, I wanted to actually make myself known and stand out. And I started talking on a stage at O2 for them. They invited me up onto the stage to talk about how we manage our customers and, and, and really starting to say, well, this is who we are. This is how good our organisation is. And this is, and, and really started to get the attention of, of, of Telefonica O2, not just through me personally, but I think leveraging our personal brand in order to showcase the organization that we're very proud of it's an interesting um, observation you made there so I started my career in um in BT and I recognize entirely that sent that that kind of experience of walking into the room as a young sort of early 20s female um and being the only woman in the room certainly in um, a management meeting that was for sure. And at industry events being one of a handful at best. Um, you made it sound really easy there, Joe. you know, the social butterfly. There is, there is something, it takes something to actually walk in and say, I am, I deserve to be here and I'm going to keep going to these events and I'm going to be confident enough to stand on stage not everyone naturally has that. So just thinking about others um, starting um, in, 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 an, in a STEM industry role or facing their own challenges, you know, it's not necessarily sort of someone new in their career, but, but lots of people kind of face up to this at different stages in their career. What advice would you give people who are kind of facing similar kind of challenges? I think a lot of us do face that imposter syndrome, you know, as, as people like to call it, where you think, do I deserve to be here? And, and maybe, you know, maybe, maybe I do, maybe I don't. And, um, you know, I remember really vividly, almost like a change, actually, of a switch of when I got invited to 10 Downing Street and an invitation dropped into my inbox from 10 Downing Street. And I thought, you know, being in tech, I should know that probably spam or <laughs> probably not genuine. And you don't know if these things are genuine or not. And even when I told my husband, he's like, oh, I'm not sure about that. Um, so I was invited to 10 Downing Street for International Women's Day for tea with the Prime Minister, you know, oh. casual. And um, and I even remember I accepted the invitation. But even on the day when I got there and I turned up with my invitation, I still didn't believe that it was real or that why, you know, again, those questions, why, why would I be invited? Why would I be one of 100 women across the UK to be invited? And even when I gave them my ticket, I still didn't think I'd get in. He was like, you know, you can go in now. And I think sort of answering your question, self-confidence holds the foundations for everything. 
And even in those moments of doubts, we have to believe in ourselves because if if we don't believe in ourselves, what you know? How do other people believe in us? So we we have to start with with really focusing on our own strengths. And, and Steve Backley, uh, a javelin, javelin Olympian, who's who's a good friend of, of the company, uh, and someone I he's a, a life coach, and, and I've spoken to him at length about different things. And I remember Steve saying to me, you know, the way that he interprets things is when you when you, when you think the tasha about walking into a room, and you think when I walk into the room, I wonder if um, they're going to like me. He can reverse that conversation and think, I wonder if I'm going to like them. Yeah. And it's about having the self-confidence to, to hold your own and, and, and to trust yourself and, and to believe in your, in your own strengths. And sometimes that takes time. As I say, you have a different type of confidence when you're 16, 17 years old, whereas you don't have anything to lose. You just want to try lots of things. But actually, when you're in your 20s and your 30s and you think you want to try new things, it takes it takes a little bit of of extra guts and resilience to say and grit to say, I'm going to give it a try. And I don't have I don't have a fear of failure and taking taking criticism as as feedback, you know, in lots of different walks of life is really important. Even when I go onto a stage and I deliver a talk. You know, I have to have confidence in myself that I've I've given it my best, and and there might be somebody in the audience that doesn't like my talk or doesn't like what I say, and that's okay because, you know, you can't expect everybody to love what you do. And I I remember writing a piece for the Guardian, and it was about um, how to negotiate a pay rise if you're a woman, um, quite a big topic, and um, really chuffed to be able to to have the opportunity to write for the Guardian, and I remember. It went online and I had, um, you know, 800 and so sort of likes or whatever it was on the piece. And I think I had three negative comments. And as a woman, or maybe just as an individual, I found myself honing in on the three negative comments. And even my husband stopped me on my tracks and went, why are you doing that? You're not looking at the 800 or so that you might have helped today. You might have helped one person walk into her office and go, do you know what? I want to be paid the same as John, who's doing the same job as me. Um, but I found myself looking at that that three negative comments, and it, I've got you know that's something that I had to stop. And it was so really it was so useful for me for somebody that I love and trust to turn around and say no, no, you, you don't expect everything everybody to like everything that you do and everything that you write because that's life, isn't it? It is, and I think one of the the, the most impactful things someone ever said to me was because I used to be so fearful of presenting, and I kept saying it's just it's not my strength, and you know, I, other people are just really good at it. You know, I'm not funny, and you know, I trip over my words, and it's it, I stopped. I would do anything to get out of it, and then someone said to me who I really respected, she said, "You do know that when you stand up, the even if they don't like what you're saying, nobody that you're talking to in that audience." want you to give a bad presentation everybody is rooting for you to do your best even if they don't like you and even if it's because it's entirely selfish because they want to get something out of whatever time they're investing on or being forced to invest in listening to everybody is rooting for you in one way or another regardless of their motivation and that made such a difference to me because I stopped walking in and going you know there's people in here who are going to laugh if I who, who laughs when you, you know, you mess up in a presentation? Nobody. And it's those small things, isn't it? And you've mentioned there are a couple of people who kind of been influential, life coach, husband. And I think that is a theme that through these podcasts comes out is that people who have been successful and, and continuously kind of progressing and, and growing their experiences like you do, Joe, and who've got successful businesses like yourself are constantly kind of, learning and, and hungry to learn from others and open to learning from others is that something you say that's been key throughout your career kind of having people around you who've supported you and who you've been open to learning from very much so and and you know I say this to to my own daughter you know that don't think that when you finish school you stop learning because I think as adults we realize that we're actually learning every day and I feel like I I'm in a position where I feel like I'm I'm reading loads and I'm trying to suck in lots of information. I love watching a TED talk. I love being inspired. Um, there's just, again, we can be inspired by listening to so many different podcasts on different types of topics, and we are learning every day. and And you're absolutely right about what you were saying about being on stage. and And somebody said something quite similar to me: is that Joe, once you get onto that stage, they are there to listen to you. 
you know, they've come and they're sitting there and they're, they're going to listen to you. And that's a massive privilege. And I think as soon as you realise that it's a privilege, you know, again, we'll always do our best. And something I also say to my children is, you know, practice doesn't make perfect. I think the word perfection is, is always setting us up for a bit of a fail. Um, you know, again, whether you're a boy or a girl, striving for perfection is, is very, very difficult. Um, but I think whatever we do, it's about striving for progress. It's practice makes progress. Um, whatever sport you're doing, whatever academics you're doing, whatever you're learning or trying to do, it is about progress. Jo, you are a passionate STEM ambassador and you've worked in schools for at least 10 years now, kind of going in and you've, you've mentioned kind of talking to, to um, students about STEM. And I'm really interested to know what's the USP, what's your selling point when you're talking to young people and encouraging them to think about and pursue a career in STEM? I, I do have a really simple USP, which is I'm a C-grade student who became an entrepreneur. And um, I, I just think it's it's really important to share that you don't have to be a straight A student uh, or a mathematician in order to, to work in STEM or to go and run your own business. And, you know, we hear a lot of success stories, don't we, about um, entrepreneurs who left school at 15, 16. And, and I'm not saying that that's the right way to go for, for, for children. Um, but it wasn't my path. I left school at 16, as, as you know. Um, I would have loved to have gone to university and maybe gone down that route, but um, it, it wasn't an option at, at that particular time. But look at the journey that it's taken me on. And um, I might actually go and get a degree at some stage because I feel like I never really fulfilled that. Um, so I'll probably end up being like a 50-year-old graduate or something but you know what I mean is what we were saying as life is 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 just a long road of learning and and it's never too late and you're never too old there's also been you know so much in the news hasn't there about 50 year olds going and setting up their own business because they feel like they've had so much life experience by then and they are they are so confident in their own selves we we've had a lot longer to get used to ourselves and actually you know, as, as we mentioned before, believing in yourself is the most important thing because uh, other other people won't do that if you don't do it yourself, I don't think. So you've got to put yourself first and really think about what you want to deliver and how you want to live your best life. Absolutely. And you've, you've mentioned a few times the importance of role modelling. And I'm guessing that part of what kind of motivates you to go and stand up and talk to people is the desire to make sure that there are more positive role models, accessible role models, that both boys and girls, but I know your passion is really around kind of women and girls into STEM, but the importance of actually putting yourself out there as somebody who has come through, who has been successful and saying, look, you can do this. Is that a key driver for you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I worked with a PR company about 10 years ago and actually they, they, they said something that was quite poignant to me and I hadn't really considered this myself, but they did say, you know, from a 16 year old, running your own business and, and having the success she says we don't actually see that joe a lot from a female perspective and she said your story is really strong and she said a lot of people would really benefit from hearing your story so it was almost like somebody mentioned it to me and it made me think what if i was to deliver my story to girls what impact would it have and even in a room of 100 girls even if i could help one girl on that one day to consider how she feels about herself um, and she might walk away that day feeling more confident more assertive and feeling like she's going to really focus on her strengths to, to to be her best self then I feel like I've done a good job so and this is where it goes back to doing those talks of even if in an in inner room of a hundred my main aim actually is just to just to help one girl and if it's one girl at a time that made me think about maybe what impact a, a book could have. So you've segued beautifully for me now there. So <laughs> um, your book, Rise of the Girl, Seven Empowering Conversations to Have with Your Daughter. It's due to be published on the 7th of October uh, by DK. What's it all about? You've started to, to kind of touch there on why you've written it. Um, and... What do you want to tell us about it? Because I, I, we've had a bit of a chat about it, but I'm, I'm really keen to share because it just sounds fabulous. And the focus that you have on parents as well as the, as well as girls themselves is, is really interesting. Oh, thank you. So Rise of the Girl, we mentioned at the beginning of, of the podcast that 
as women, we've come a long way in the last hundred years, but we know that there's uh, a lot of work to be done. And I kept reading in the news about um, girls performing on par to boys or sometimes outperforming boys, but still not putting their hand up to take an opportunity, still not putting their hand up to try something new or sometimes just having that fear of failure, um, you know, working towards perfection all the time. I know social media can be a real love-hate relationship for teenagers as well. Um, But what I wanted to do was think about what conversations were happening in households for parents of of daughters and caregivers of daughters uh, around the world. And I took a look at my conversations that I have with my 11-year-old daughter, nearly 12, Um, the way she sometimes would throw her pencil across the kitchen because she's struggling with her maths. I can't do it. Um, the importance of role models, you know, if you can't see them, you can't be them. Um, what happens when we fail? Uh, what happens when we lose matches? And what are the conversations and what are the seven conversations we can be having when those situations happen in our own kitchens or living rooms? And and that gave me a really good focus um, to, to to put all of that thread together. And my first chapter is called Seven because so much of who we are, Natasha, is already sort of hardwired by seven. My friends get quite frightened by the seven. It's like, oh, I have to make sure I, I get them just right by seven. I said, no, it's not about that. But it just it just reinforces that that the early years are really important. And I think it's, we, we know that. We know that early childhood is, is crucial. But not just that. It's so much of their personality is shaped by seven. So when you look at a seven-year-old child that's standing in front of you, you know, embrace them. That is who they are. You know, a a lot of their personality won't change from there. That's their sort of hardwired. So now how do you grow that seven-year-old? And we can start by encouraging them to sit in a classroom in front of a teacher. And when they are asked a question, let's say they're asked a maths question, and they are 70% sure that they know the answer. They're not 100% sure. They're 70% sure they're going to put their hand up and and take a shot at it. Because having having the representation of putting your hand up, I'm not saying put your hand up all the time. I think teachers will be after me if I keep getting (laughs) children to put their hands up every five seconds. But putting your hand up at the right time because you're not afraid of getting it wrong. You're not afraid of failure. You're afraid of, you know, you're just, you're not, it's it's just the case of really believing in yourself to, to put yourself out there a little bit. Because what we find is, when I talked about negotiating a pay rise or, or when you go for a promotion, that seven-year-old who turns into the 27-year-old is suddenly going to go for this role um, and she's 70% sure that she can do it. She's not sure if she's 100% sure, but she needs to do this because if she doesn't, she won't be getting that position because we don't have enough women in leadership because it's got to start from when they're seven years old, which is why the chapter is called Seven. It's a, a really lovely chapter. And, and what I've got is I've got amazing contributors that are through the threads of the book across the different conversations. Um, so when we're thinking about role models, I've got some amazing people talking about maybe the role models that they had in their child and how it's shaped who they've become and how they went on to earn an MBA and go to Downing Street and do all of these amazing things. How do you know where does where does that come from? And the people that were really quiet in school, really shy, but how they managed to find their voice and, and you know, potentially made changes in, 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 in Parliament and uh, found their voice in order to drive positive change. So I'm really excited about the book, um, as you can probably tell. And um, I really hope that, as I say, even if it can change one girl, because a lot of it will come through the parents. As parents and caregivers, so much starts at home. So part of me really wanted to write a book for, for girls. Um, But this first book is going to go through the parents because I think if we can really help them to have those empowering conversations at home, it will feed through to the girls. And it's an interesting angle, actually. Um, We do some work with um, the Alito Foundation. And when we've been talking with them around changing the face of leadership, creating more diversity in leadership and do a number of different programs with them um, across industry and within the recruitment sector. They're very much about changing the perception of the parent as much as the perception of the young people coming through in terms of thinking about what are respectable careers or safe careers. You know, there's still kind of breaking down some of these 
ideas and misconceptions around you know that career for life kind of pathway that that still lots of parents kind of really hope for and aspire for for their children because it feels safe so it's really interesting that you're kind of following as your first book that same sort of focus on we need to be looking at that young that young girl in her whole and the whole girl at seven three to 17 is still very much wrapped up in their family so yeah really interesting I can't wait you know I've already got it on pre-order to, <laughs> to to read and have conversations with my niece um I think it's been a long time coming um and I think you know a really really exciting time um just moving on to your parenting and lifestyle blog joe you know another thing that you do just just one more um you've built an impressive following as I mentioned in the introduction um what inspired you to create Guilty Mother? And, you know, again, what what do you share? What's it all about? Yeah, so I started blogging in 2016. My daughter was quite young. I just felt like I was juggling, as, as a lot of people do, uh, you know, the, the mother load, parenting and, and, and trying to be an entrepreneur. Uh, and just I just felt like uh, a little bit of guilt was seeping in because I was getting home later and not always putting her to bed. And, and again, nobody was putting this on me. It was all just self-reflection, really. And I found myself Googling one night mum guilt just to see what would come up. And nothing came up, Natasha. And I was really shocked. I was thinking maybe I'm the only person that's feeling like this. Surely somebody else must be feeling like this. So I just thought if nobody's really talking about it, maybe I'll open the conversation I don't really know where that inspiration came from, but I just thought maybe if I talked about mum guilt a little bit, maybe other people might benefit from hearing it as well. Um, and so I suppose with being in tech, I'm you know quite good on a computer. So I just, I bought the domain name and I set up a website within 24 hours. So, you know, pretty quick. And I mentioned to my husband again, um, the name Guilty Mother, I thought it was quite fun because it's about, you know, reversing it really, trying not to feel guilty. Um, again, that positivity coming through. And he said, oh, Guilty Mother, that's really fun. Yeah, you should you should get that. So, yeah, bought the trademark and set up guiltymother.co.uk and just started sharing. And, and again, the first couple of blogs I shared, um, I think like five people read it. It was probably like my mum, my nan, my best <laughs> friend, you know, rent a crowd. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe this isn't, maybe this isn't really what I should be doing. And again, that grit and perseverance and resilience is really important that we instill in our children. So there was a lot of opportunities for me to quit. I mean, was I expecting rapid results straight away? And, and actually, I started to, to grow the blog, and I really sort of persevered with it. And, and as you say, I don't really know how I got to this magic sort of 50,000 following. And I just got, I've got such a loyal group of followers that, um, that follow me and, and it's opened lots of opportunities. I, I really started writing it as a bit of a cathartic outlet, really, and and, uh, and and enabled me to just share lots of different content, whether it's about being an entrepreneur, about raising strong girls, why resilience is important in children, and um, writing about lifestyle. I was then able to go on some, obviously, holidays. So you get, you know, the, that's the, one of the benefits. So I said to the family, we're going to go to Greece and we'll, We've got a free holiday. I just need to write about it on the blog. And my family like, what? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm thinking, now we're talking. Um, yeah, but they, don't, they, <laughs> they don't come up very often. But, you know, when they do, I've worked with Martin all quite a few times. We're going out to look at, you know, we're, we're writing about one of their resorts in, in, in Portugal in October if we get there. Um, and that sort of stuff is brilliant. There are lots of perks. You know, I get to take the kids to the theatre and we do lots of day trips out. But it wasn't ever about that. And I think that's what the following really like is, um, you know, very genuine, write about lots of different types of subjects. But a lot of it isn't financially led because it's not actually my main job. So I really like supporting business owners. So if a woman has started up their own business, they might come to me and say, I've launched this product. I'd love for you to give it a little shout out on the blog. And that's you know, I find that quite difficult to say to say no to, um, because it's really nice to be supporting small business at the moment as well. Yeah, absolutely. And look, Joe, it, I think you, in a few sentences there, just summed up why it is important to persevere, <laughs> why it is important to kind of feel the fear and do it anyway. Um, yeah, you know, there are perks at the end of it. It's, you know, it might take you a while to get there, but you know, there may be a free holiday in it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Joe, um 
coming back to kind of your passion about in attracting more young people more women and more young girls into into stem what would you say are the biggest misconceptions that discourage potentially brilliant people who are so well kind of fitting with stem careers from actually pursuing it oh perhaps it's just uh, maybe it's that young girls think that they are not performing as well as boys maybe that they think they need to be um you know to be good at all the different subjects whether they need to be good at science and maths and 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 all the different types of subjects but they don't it could just be one that they are really really good at and it's just what is their natural flair and what can they lean to and another really important thing is their jobs that they will probably take their careers have probably not been created yet so the likelihood is they'll they'll have a job that that doesn't exist which sounds crazy doesn't it when you say that um, but there's just so much diversity, I think, in STEM careers, um, whether it's whether they're working in digital, whether they could be working for a company like Apple, whether they could be using their creative skills. Um, you don't have to be a mathematician in order to work in STEM, and, 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 and I'm not. Um, but I do love working in tech, and I love seeing technology change. And, you know, my brother's always said, you can't work for us if you don't like change, because every week, you know, things change. And, and that's where it's been actually, even through the pandemic, we are pretty much working virtually anyway, we encourage all our staff to work from wherever they need to, as long as we perform well, and they deliver good results, uh, we don't need to look over their shoulder to make sure that they're doing that. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I think working in the STEM environment is just is just really, really exciting. It's an exciting time. And I love seeing girls doing engineering and creating robots. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I wish I did stuff like that at school. And my daughter comes home learning about aerodynamics. And I just think it's great. I just think I just want to see more of it. And I love hearing girls talking about it. But we've got to show them the role models that are doing it as well. Um they've got to see people that are in that industry. And uh, I mean, so many of the amazing women that have worked on finding the, you know, the, the vaccine that, and, and uh, again, it's giving them a, a big shout out. I want to say Kate Bingham, but I might have got that wrong. Um, but the, the lady that sort of pioneered so much of the actual vaccine rollout uh, on behalf of the government, um, so she only came in to deliver that to bring the army in and to do that and it's just she 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 wanted to you know she's quite quiet behind behind it all but i just think i think it's really powerful when you know that there's a woman that's behind all of the all of the mathematics that goes behind organizing it absolutely and <laughs> you know there are so many exciting roles um and exciting opportunities and within tech and within engineering um, and the ability to influence and shape and be part of shaping futures and solving some of the biggest problems and challenges worldwide, those solutions are going to come from people working within the STEM sectors. And, you know, I think you're absolutely touched on it there. As an in, as a kind of, as a collective we all need to work together to share those amazing case studies and examples and role models and opportunities better than we do at the moment. And I think, you know, that's a key message for me from today that, you know, what else can we be doing? So if, you're, if you work within a STEM company, think about how can you showcase the great stuff that's going on within your company, within your your particular kind of specialist area and how can we kind of share that information I know that we we're going to talk more about this but how can we share that and get into and start having conversations with young people it's so important to all take responsibility for that right it is but it can start so simply there are loads of um loads of people out there men women that can just take half an hour to go and join an assembly at a school any school um and tell them about their career it makes a massive impact and I don't know I mean we didn't really have people coming into our school very much when I was younger um I remember the policeman coming in um uh, probably talk about safety and what have you and but yeah you know, there wasn't there wasn't really anything else that was memorable for me um but whatever career you're in whether you're an engineer and you're talking about how you build bridges and things like that which you do for a living you know people want to hear about that they might think that's not interesting that's 
what I've done for 20 years. But oh my goodness, that seven year old that might be in, sitting in front of you might want to go and be in the Royal Engineers and, and, and build bridges. Um, you know, who knows? Who knows? But yeah, if, if you're not if you're not showcasing what you do to other other children, you, you can't, they, they can't learn. They need to learn from 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 others. We've got to be that generation that pass it down the line. It's such a big responsibility. But I tell you what, if somebody goes in and delivers that 30 minute assembly and then just goes off to work, they'll be feeling really good about themselves that day. You know, it's just I, I try to do that where I can. And as you know, I do work for EY Foundation and Founders for School. It's all voluntary. And I know we're all pushed for time. But I just I like how it makes me feel, and I and I hope that the, the the children really get something from it. Some of them might be might not get anything from it because you can't you can't you know please everybody all of the time. But I really hope there will be someone that comes out and thinks, God, I really want to work in tech now. I just yeah, really want to do what Joe does. Yeah, absolutely. And I can imagine you've inspired a lot of young people, Joe. You mentioned um, the Y Foundation there. There are lots of organisations, there are lots of kind of people who are there to help facilitate kind of, they make it easy for you. EY Foundation is fantastic. We're, we're connected with them ourselves. Um, and it does make a difference when you talk to the people who run those kind of programmes. Um, it makes a massive difference in terms of people's lives and long term futures. So, yeah. Really exciting stuff. Um, Joe, before we end, we've talked about how exciting tech is. So I want to ask you, what's the most exciting future tech trend that we should all be on the lookout for? Well, I suppose, you know, jobs in AI is, is all very exciting. People are talking a lot about that, which, uh, which, is, which is slightly daunting in a way. But, um, you know, this digital transf- transformation is, is really here now. And then again, what we were talking earlier about a lot of the careers that are our children will go into um well they haven't they haven't been designed yet or created yet so that is really exciting um I, yeah i don't know i'm just trying to think now i mean from from robot hoovers to goodness knows what everything seems to be changing and you can use technology um for so much now and, and obviously we've seen how technology has enabled us to have a completely different hybrid type of working which as you say i think it's going to be really strange to go back to our, our normal working ways um, so let's see what technology can do from now I know that uh, obviously even like the new Apple iOS software that's coming out in September they're sort of bringing out their own improved almost like their version of Zoom really I think they're trying to get a bit of a, a bit of a cut of the action really um, what, what FaceTime can't do at the moment but there's lots of exciting technologies I think that are coming uh, and I always love to see what Apple do as well. You know, how far the, 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 the iPhone has come since it was created by Steve Jobs. Was it 2007 now? So um, it's come a huge, a huge journey on, on, on technology and enabling people to, to work from anywhere, which is fantastic, really. Um, so, yeah, see, see what the next 10 years brings, I imagine. Non-stop innovation, I'd imagine. Um, <laughs> Joe, my final question. Um, if you were me and you were hosting the Progressing Lives Everywhere podcast, I'd love to know who would be your dream guest to have a chat with, like I'm talking to you today, to um, uncover their insights into progression and how they progress their own life or the life of others. You know, somebody that I really admire, which you might not expect, is Reese Witherspoon. And the reason why I just really admire her, and I don't know if you've ever heard her talk at different events. Yeah. She's really positive, really inspirational, um, has carved out an incredible career for herself from very humble beginnings. Um, she, I, I love the way, not only is she a phenomenal actress, but when we talk about gender parity and, and things around that level, she's, she's very much on par with that. And when she was frustrated why how things were in the film industry, I know that she um, went off and created her own production company, you might know, called Hello Sunshine. Um, and I just think it's been a tremendous success. And again, there aren't many women that are going off and doing that. So I just think absolutely fair play to her for saying, I don't like how, how this industry is running at the moment. So do you know what? I'm just going to do it myself. 
and comes out with things like big little lies and little fires everywhere and goodness knows what else is coming. Um, and the way that she speaks about uh, her career and how important it is to be a woman and to show how things should be done, uh, I think is, is really, really tremendous. So I think she's a great role model for young girls. Not only that, but obviously she loves books as well. Absolutely, she yeah, she does. Club. Do you know, with Reese Withers being the, the other thing, and it's, it's probably another thing, you know, whether you recognise it or not, as an entrepreneur, though, she, she's put her money where her mouth is. And she's when she didn't like how things were doing, done and she went and set up her own production company, that was all self-funded and she, she ploughed it. But when I've listened and read her story, she ploughed pretty much everything into it. Um, so, so we can learn yeah. so much from that, can't we? You yeah. know, that, that overcoming the fear of failure... Absolutely. Uh, and determination. It wouldn't happen overnight. She must have had to work really, really hard. Um yeah. and and she's absolutely smashed it. And I just think she's she's doing tremendously well. So yeah, just somebody that popped into my mind that I really admire. And she's still young. She's still got so much so much of her career to to go as well. Absolutely. I love that answer because nobody said Reese with a super to me before <laughs> as well. So I do like an original answer to that question. Jo, I, I loved every moment of speaking to you today. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been a real pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me.